So it is uh, my pleasure and honor to welcome our guest professor, Muhammad Gahad Atta. He's a professor of medicine, John Hopkins University School of Medicine uh, in the United States. Uh, he's senior uh, nephrologist because this is the date of birth, 62, so 50, 58 years now. Uh, this is the evolution of education. He started his journey since a very old uh, uh, time at Mansoura Faculty of Medicine, then uh, residency at Urology and Nephrology Center in Mansoura University, and then the New York uh, Cabrini Medical Center Fellowship John Hopkins until he became full professor of medicine at John Hopkins, which is well-known uh, School of Medicine. This is the, one of the very old photos. I think it is 31 years now from 89. And this is the professor uh, Gahad, Muhammad Gahad Atta, and the professor Ayman Rafai, the moderator of this session. So this is since 31 years. It is very old, but it reflects how Professor Gahad is enthusiastic to do something. And then the areas of expertise are including and encompassing uh, the, the hot issues in nephrology, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, Fabry disease, glomerular nephritis, HIV, and this is the, the area of expertise because uh, when I reviewed PubMed publication, I found more than 59 publications in HIV-related kidney disease it's fantastic work, von Hebel in there, hypertension and all aspects. Dr. Atta is a member of the Health Disparity Committee at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in Maryland, the Scientific Council on Kidney of the American Heart Association, the International Society of Nephrology and the American Society of Nephrology. He has participated as principal investigator in several studies, clinical trials, and Professor Aymer Rifai will give a hint about uh, the publications, citation uh, uh, within his uh, welcoming message. He's a reviewer and in the, the very prestigious journals in the field of medicine and nephrology and genomics. So it is very uh, prestigious CV. This, is, uh, this uh, are two articles. I consider them a very nice reference overview about HIV and the kidney. And they were published in two prestigious journals in the, in the field of nephrology, Journal of American Society of Nephrology about kidney disease and HIV. And this is a Kirigo uh, conference statements. And I recommend that those who are interested in HIV and the kidney to review these uh, two articles. Also for genomics and the fibrous disease, I like this article because it considers a step forward to establish good enzymatic therapy uh, for treating fibrous disease. And uh, this is, although it is a case report that was published in Lancet since more than 10 years, but I found it very exciting. Why? Because MRI coronal MRI images, T2, shows bilateral microcyst in a female patient who had a family history of, poly, of, of father who died of renal failure. So the most probable diagnosis was polycystic kidney disease. But after thorough evaluation of the genetic workup and investigations, uh, the uh, polycystic kidney disease diagnosis is, uh, was declined because these are normal size kidneys. And the diagnosis was lithium related because the patient uh, was treated with antipsychotic drug lithium for 10 20 years. So this is the MRI finding of chronic lithium exposure. It's fantastic, although it is case report. Uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Gada Atta is uh, sharing in sport. This is the John Hopkins uh, team. So this is uh, a very nice hobby. He visited us here. Uh, on the 37th Annual Congress of the Egyptian Sort of Nephrology and Transplantation uh, last year, when he delivered the two fantastic presentation about acute cardiorenal syndrome and uh, nephrology, nephrotoxicity of chemotherapy in the onco-nephrology sessions. And both presentation left an excellent uh, impression. This is the, during his tour within the pyramids. And the, uh, regarding the polycystic kidney disease, all of us as Professor Yad Said mentioned, it's a very exciting topic. 
And the, the main specialty of our center is transplantation. And this is Professor Hunayn, the founder of the center, Professor Sobh, and all the team, the seniors, and Professor Amr Fai, the moderator of the session, and the current uh, chief of the unit in this photo. We have now 3,128 uh, transplantation. All of them are live and more than 90% live related. And as Professor Ata asked about Corona, because of Corona, we, uh, the program was logged uh, for, uh, since 11th of March. And we hope to start uh, next week. Uh, regarding polycystic kidney disease as an original kidney disease, we have 90, uh, 89 cases who were transplanted because of renal failure after diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease. It is really problematic, as Professor Riyad mentioned, to select the donor, live donors, to do genetic testing or not, how to follow them, what are the lines of management. So I think it will be fantastic talk from Professor uh, Ata. So we are uh, uh, elated and excited to hear the, his update of polycystic kidney disease. And before the Professor Ata presentation, I'd like to leave the mic to Professor Ayman Rifai to welcome uh, our guest, Professor Rifai. Just unmute yourself, Dr. Ayman. Thank you very much, Professor Hussain. Uh, and I'm really, it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome a dear and old friend and colleague, Professor uh, Muhammad Ata. Um, I know Dr. Atta since 32 years when I joined the team of nephrology and transplantation units at Mansoura Urology and Nephrology Center in September 1988. Uh, at that time, Dr. Atta was a nephrology resident and I worked with him for two years. Then he left to uh, the States in 1990. As you said, first, uh, he worked in Cabrini Medical Center in New York, where he got his American board in internal medicine. And then he moved to John Hopkins University and got the American board in nephrology. Uh, actually, really, it's, it's, it's a long journey of success that he deserved. Uh, Dr. Atta has, uh, according to Scobus, uh, 104 international uh, publications. Uh, in uh, prestigious and high-ranked journals uh, with an H index of 29. Uh, as Professor Hassan said, his research interest is in kidney diseases and HIV patients. I think today topic, is, uh, which is polycystic kidney disease, is really an important and challenging disease for nephrologists, and we are expecting an interesting update from a pioneer in the field. Please, Dr. Atta. Thank you, Professor Rafai, for uh, these statements. And then I'm going to stop the chair of my slides. Uh, and uh, would you please start uh, your chair, Professor Atta? And I'm going to give the, you the right to share the screen. Please share your screen. And until you share the screen, I would like to welcome all our guests from Arab world, from Egypt, and from Africa because we have uh, very important doctors from Africa who joined this meeting. Um, and uh, we will take the questions. If you have any question, please write your question in the chat. And uh, after the presentation, we'll go to uh, discuss your questions and then to give uh, those uh, professors who will uh, uh, raise their hand to a chair in their commentaries. Uh, now it is uh, my honor and pleasure to Leave the mic to Professor Atta. Well, <clears throat> thank you both, uh, Dr. Shiha and Dr. Rafai, for the very nice introduction. I hope I deserve it. <laughs> and uh, I am really happy to, uh, to be uh, around old friends, for sure. And I hope uh, the uh, lecture can give you some of the highlights uh, that occurred in the area of uh, adult uh, polycystic kidney disease in the past uh, 15 years. So uh, uh, obviously the goal is to prevent this, and this is really a kidney that we removed from uh, uh, a patient with uh, polycystic kidney disease. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I know that the topic is very 
complex and, uh, and uh, detailed, and there is a lot of literature on it. Uh, uh, my goal is really to focus on the last 15 years. Uh, what did we learn in, in the last 15 years? Some of the highlights, uh, of course, I'm not going to uh, be detailed in, on every topic, but uh, um, hopefully by the end uh, you can tell uh, what happened in this uh, uh, area. So if we look at the genetic uh, architecture of kidney disorders in, in general, you have here on the x-axis the allele frequency, and on the y-axis, this is effect size. And when we say the allele frequency, so if you have a SNP or a mutation, uh, these are common alleles that are very common, and, uh, but the effect size of these mutations or SNPs uh, are very small. Uh, in fact, uh, the only one that, uh, that we think is the highest uh, effect size is the, uh, uh, is the known apolipoprotein uh, risk allele uh, that is uh, very common in West Africa and is associated with uh, non-diabetic uh, kidney diseases, specifically focal segmental uh, kidney disease. On the other spectrum, uh, you have all these uh, rare or ultra-rare uh, alleles, uh, but the effect size is so huge. And obviously, the uh, good example, any mutation that uh, is associated with uh, uh, nephrotic syndrome, bodocin, or uh, 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 some of the uh, other trip uh, C6 or collagen for alpha. And uh, you will see that uh, polycystic kidney disease will fall into this area where you have a, a considerable uh, rare, although the most, it is the most common genetic kidney disease, uh, BKD, uh, but the effect size obviously uh, is high. And there's a lot of other cystic kidney disease and sometimes we confuse tubular interstitial kidney disease with uh, polycystic kidney disease as well. So that's really just overview of all genetic uh, uh, kidney disorders. Now, uh, one thing that I really, uh, and I'll take it from the article that you showed Dr. Sheha that not all um, cysts are created equal and, and definitely uh, sometimes we get confused with the diagnosis of uh, polycystic kidney disease in, in a lot of patients because of uh, multiple cysts and, and I'll go over this uh, in a bit of uh, details. The other thing that is really important, the uh, spectrum or the phenotypic spectrum is so huge in these patients uh, uh, between families uh, and even within uh, each family, there is a lot of uh, uh, spectrum, and I'm going to try to uh, shed some lights about why, why there is a lot of phenotypic uh, uh, differences between uh, patients. So just, uh, and I'm sure you, you all know this, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, you have bilateral kidney disease, and this is really uh, the important uh, finding uh, that will be diagnosed by imaging. And then you have in this stage kidney disease by age 50 uh, in 50% 50 of patients. And here we're talking about mostly patients with uh, PKD1. And then it is a systemic disease. You have liver, pancreas, uh, uh, or pancreatic cysts. You have cardiovascular defects like uh, prolapse. You have intracranial and aortic aneurysm, and the intracranial uh, aneurysm happen in about 8% of patients with uh, PKD1. The mutations are uh, in two genes, uh, mostly, and you will find out that there are other genes involved, uh, but the, the most common ones are the PKD1 on chromosome 16, and then uh, PKD2 on chromosome 4. And there was... Uh, Nothing uh, about the disease before 1995 uh, until um, uh, two years in a row, uh, the BKD1 was cloned uh, in 95 and then uh, BKD2 uh, was cloned in 96. So this was really the initial phase of what happened uh, in BKD literature uh, after uh, those two publications. And everybody was excited about the, the cloning of the two genes and they thought uh, we got it and now we know where to look and uh, we're gonna find the cure for BKD. 
problems. Problem number one, uh, that the BKD1 gene is so huge. Uh, it's 46 exon, and you can see the transcripts or the uh, coding region uh, right here, the mRNA, uh, compared to the BKD2, which is only 15 exons, still large, but uh, compared to this one, <coughs> which is 46 uh, uh, exon, not only that, uh, we found out that the, there's a lot of uh, duplications in the gene, uh, so we call it pseudogenes. So uh, that's why genetic testing can be even uh, a problem because you can find a pseudogene uh, similar to the BKD1 gene, but it doesn't have any transcript, it doesn't have any product actually to cause disease. And that really made, made the uh, uh, investigation of uh, BKD1 genes so difficult. So if you look at the product of, of the BKD1 and BKD2, you will see that uh, the polycystin, which is a protein, uh, the product from uh, BKD1 is so huge as well. So that's 43 amino acid. It has extracellular domain and it has 11 transmembrane domain here. And then it has a small uh, cytoplasmic uh, tail, uh, 200 amino acid. So again, huge protein. And then you have the polycystin two, which basically is smaller. Uh, it acts like a cation uh, channel. So that's really where uh, the calcium goes inside the cell. So it has a pore here. So the both uh, polycystin one and polycystin two uh, basically will uh, uh, interact at the cytoplasmic tail so the carboxy terminal of polycystin one and carboxy terminal of polycystin two will interact to modulate the uh, uh, signal, uh, signal pathway in, uh, in the uh, primary cilia. Now, <clears throat> there are other proteins that we are not gonna talk about. And this is a zinc finger protein and fibrocystin. Fibrocystin uh, is a product uh, that is if uh, the gene encoding for fibrocystin is mutated that causes the autosomal recessive, uh, uh, which is in pediatric. So I'm not gonna discuss that. This is the most severe form. If you have a mutation in the gene encoding for the uh, zinc uh, uh, protein, uh, you get a milder form of autosomal recessive. So uh, I'm gonna just focus on the uh, PC1 and PC2, which are the adult forms of uh, polycystic kidney disease. Now, if you look at the uh, expression of the uh, uh, polycystin, you will find that it's mainly expressed in the cilium. Uh, so here is polycystin one and polycystin two, and they interact at the cytoplasmic uh, uh, tail here uh, in the tight junction at the basolateral membrane, but also in the mitochondria in the ER and the plasmic uh, reticulum, and also in the mitochondria. So it's widely expressed, and 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 really, one of the problem is that we don't know what it it does. So until today, as of today, we don't know the function of polycystin uh, one. We know the function of uh, polycystin two, which really is uh, uh, once the interaction happened at the cytoplasmic tail that uh, you have uh, uh, the signal or the, the channel opens for calcium to get inside the cell. But for polycystin one, we don't know if it's a mechanoreceptor. It uh, basically uh, if it does uh, sense the flow uh, in the urine uh, uh, or it's a, a GP uh, coupled receptor uh, or it's a cell cell receptor, cell matrix receptor, nobody uh, as of today knows the function of polycystin one and that makes it obviously difficult as well. But one of the early observation uh, in polycystic kidney disease uh, that was made actually in the 70s that uh, cysts forms only in less than 5%. In fact, it's, it's probably 1% of the tubules that get affected with the cyst. And these are usually in the distant nephron. And not only that, not just in the distant nephron, but also for each tubule that is affected, uh, only uh, the, the cystic formation is focal. And this was a mystery uh, for why, why the cysts are only happening uh, in, in focal ways, despite the fact that you have uh, an individual that inherited the, the BKD1 uh, mutation. So the first clue came from uh, actually Greg Germino, 
uh, who uh, Greg Germino uh, uh, was, uh, I was in the lab at that time and I was doing some uh, work uh, in a different uh, area and his lab was next to my lab. Uh, and uh, this was in 1996, so right after the uh, uh, two years or one year after the cloning of PKD1. So he isolated uh, the tubules from a patient with polycystic kidney disease and really say, this is a tubule, so every cell has the genetic or the germline mutation. So why only one uh, cell that actually will turn into making cyst? And the, the idea or the hypothesis at the time that uh, there is a two-hit hypothesis. You get a germline mutation in, in one cell, but then you get a somatic mutation. So somatic mutation obviously is not inherited in the second allele. So you lose the heterozygosity of, of, of the gene. And therefore that cell will start actually making the cyst. So in fact, we know that the majority of patients with BKD1 will have this somatic mutation. Problem was that some patients don't have somatic mutation. Uh, so he showed in this paper of cell uh, in 1996 that the majority of cells that actually transform into these cysts in a focal way uh, develop somatic mutation. So since the uh, the two hit hypothesis uh, over uh, the following 10 years, uh, the, the new hypothesis that really uh, came about was uh, the dose model uh, uh, hypothesis. And the dose model is that you have, it's, it's really about the level of the polycystin that we make that will dictate the, uh, uh, if the patients will make cysts or not, meaning, that if this is a level of PC1 or uh, polycystin 1, if you have zero polycystin that goes to the cilia, that's lethal. If you have no polycystin, uh, you, you cannot survive. And then you have from zero to 100%. If you have 100%, obviously you have a normal kidney. Uh, and in between, you have 25% or 50%. But these are modified. It's not just uh, uh, the level of polycystin. It's the type of mutation that actually dictate the level of polycystin product. So in the adult onset, you have the heterozygous mutation, and this will give you the uh, uh, polycystic form that we see all the time. But on the other hand, if you have a mutation in BKD2, you make almost 60 to 70% of the polycystin, and that's why you have a less severe uh, disorder uh, there are other mutations will give you few cysts. And then there are modifying factors. <clears throat> so you have the mutation, each cell has a mutation, but then there is uh, uh, modifying factors. And one of them that we mentioned is somatic uh, uh, mutation. So obviously if you have a, a germline mutation and then you develop uh, through life a somatic mutation, you modify the, the dose of the polycystin. And that will lead to formation of cysts. But there are also other uh, modifying factors that has been discovered uh, in the past uh, 10 years. So what are these modifying factors? I'm not gonna mention all of them, but I'll give you some of the new ones that have been uh, shown recently. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one from uh, uh, GCI uh, last year that shows that actually crystal formation can trigger so if you have the mutation and you get the crystal, which like oxalate crystals, which we make a lot of crystals depending on your diet, obviously. And these crystals will activate <clears throat> the mTOR or mammalian target of rabamycin and this uh, transcription factor stat that will lead to, that's normal impact. Once you get a stone or crystal into the tubules, you activate these, you dilate the tubule so you can expel the crystal in the urine. And if you have a normal kidney without a genetic mutation, the mTOR and STAT3 will get inactivated and then tubular constriction will take place and then the normal flow will, will, will happen. But if you have a genetic mutation, there will be persistent activation of mTOR 
and the STAT uh, uh, three transcription factor, and that will lead to uh, cystogenesis. And this group actually <coughs> uh, showed that <coughs> in cohort of uh, ADPKD patients, that uh, <coughs> lower level of uh, urinary excretion of citrate, uh, which as you know, uh, inhibitor of uh, calcium crystal formation, correlated with uh, increased disease severity. And as you know, we use uh, citrate in a lot of uh, kidney stone patients. So this is one modifying factor that actually can lead to uh, uh, initiation or progression of uh, polycystic kidney disease. The other uh, modifying factor was actually an observation that was made by uh, a scientist uh, from Italy. And she was in Greg Gemino lab at Hopkins uh, and then moved to Milan uh, to start her own lab. And what she found or observed in her lab that if she has a, a BKD1, uh, the wild type, and you put it in a media, a cell media, and compare it to BKD1 mutated cell, uh, that lacks the, police, uh, the BKD1, that the media gets acidified, acidified very quickly. So you can see here, that this is really an observation that was by luck. So the media gets colored, different color, and it, she found out that this color is actually lactate. So she went on uh, to investigate what happened in, 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 in these uh, 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 cells of ADBKD. And it was really uh, amazing that uh, it looks like that, and I'm gonna take you back to your Crips cycle. Uh, I hope you remember the TSA or the, uh, the tricarboxylic uh, cycle that we use usually, we use uh, glucose and glucose becomes uh, glucose 6-phosphate and then it transforms into bioavate that goes to the uh, TSA cycle in the, into the mit mitochondria. And she found out that really that in, in mutated uh, uh, BKD cells, in fact, the, the pathway doesn't go this way. Uh, it actually shifts to the uh, glycolysis and also the bentose shunt. And basically what happened is that BKD cells don't use TSA as much. They don't care about the energy uh, that you get from the T uh, carboxylic acid cycle, they care about building blocks because if you shift uh, from uh, the normal pathway to the glycolysis, you make a lot of uh, fatty acid uh, uh, and you make a lot of acetyl coenzyme A. You need a lot of carbons. You need these building blocks uh, to make uh, a cell. And therefore you don't need as much energy as uh, the cell proliferate. So if you look at really, it, she looked at the abundance of these uh, 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 intermediate uh, products of the Krebs cycle and the uh, glycolysis. And you can see here that the glycolysis, the uh, differential abundance is so, so high, the bentose shunt is elevated, the glutamine, which obviously glutamine goes to citrate and citrate uh, gets out to make more acetyl coenzyme A, which give you a lot of carbons to, again, building blocks for cell membrane and so forth. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation is decreased. The fat acid oxidation is decreased and the fat acid synthesis is definitely increased. So that's really the, what we call metabolic rewiring in ADBKD. And uh, the, the, this is what we call also the Warburg effect. And the Warburg effect, uh, this is a German physiologist, has been known from the 30s, uh, last century, uh, 1930s. Uh, the Warburg effect is basically in a differentiated uh, cell. Uh, if you have glucose, you use the uh, TSA, you make 36 ATP, as you know. Uh, if you don't have glucose, you use the glycolysis, you make virovate and the anaerobic glycolysis uh, give you the uh, uh, 2 ATP. But in proliferative tissue and cancer tissue, it doesn't matter whether you have glucose or not, I mean oxygen or not. Whether you have oxygen or you don't have oxygen, you are always using the glycolytic uh, pathway because you wanna build your cells. And, and, and in fact, in the last 10 years, there is a lot of interest about really inhibiting glycolysis in cancer patients. So cancer patients also use the same. So they use fermentation, you wanna make 
uh, 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 products in the cell and, and uh, so most cancer cells use this glycolysis rather than uh, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic glycolysis uh, rather than uh, the normal pathway of a differentiated tissue. So the third, so I, I, I spoke about uh, the crystals, I spoke about uh, the uh, Warburg effect, the glycolysis that is increased in, uh, in BKD cells. In fact, the glucose is a bad thing to give to your uh, BKD patients. So the, the, the definitely one of the uh, treatment strategy now is to limit the glucose intake uh, because you don't want the cell to use it for glycolysis. Uh, the third modifying factor, which has been discovered in the last probably 10 years, these modifying uh, proteins in the ER, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know that in the, in the nucleus, you, make B, uh, you have the BKD1 gene and BKD2 gene, and then you get the mRNA transcripts, gets out of the nucleus, and then it has to go like any uh, uh, transcript, uh, it has to go to the ER in the plasmic reticulum for quality control. Uh, quality control meaning that you can remove glucose. So like uh, these uh, glucosidase uh, uh, protein will take uh, uh, glucose or oligosaccharides out of the protein. Uh, you have the uh, DNA GP, which is a heat shock protein. And this is really uh, is responsible for folding of uh, the uh, uh, protein uh, not only folding it, but also transporting the, uh, the PC1 and PC2 to the Georgia apparatus and uh, to the cilia. So you have this transport protein and the folding protein, and you have these uh, quality control proteins that really make sure that you have the right polycystine. Because if you don't, it gets degraded into the cytoplasm. It doesn't get there. So uh, now we know that if you have mutation in these uh, uh, genes uh, uh, encoding for this protein, you can actually have ADPKD. In fact, uh, the, the uh, polycystic kidney disease, if you have uh, a mutation in the gene for the DNA uh, GP11, uh, you get a, a different uh, uh, ADPKD that looks like uh, the autosomal tubular interstitial disease. You can actually confuse those two disorders, so you have one, a smaller kidney uh, and with, uh, less cyst than the adult uh, polycystic kidney disease, the typical one that you have uh, uh, seen uh, in, in, uh, in imaging. So these are uh, these uh, protein that uh, uh, have been responsible for ADBKD. We know that the BKD1 is the most common uh, BKD2 uh, is obviously less common, so this is 1 in 1,400, uh, uh, that's the prevalence. And uh, in certain areas, we know that it's 1 in 500 or 1 in 1,000, but that's really the minimal prevalence uh, is 1 in 1,400. Uh, polycystin 2, 1 in 4,000, and then the, uh, these uh, uh, glucosidase uh, protein or in, uh, gene mutations, it's 1 in 4,000. The, this heat shock protein and one in 12,000 and then ALG, which is one in 6,000. All these uh, proteins uh, or genes uh, can actually get mutated and lead to uh, polycystic kidney disease. Obviously, we know that BKD1 and BKD2 are the most common. Not only that, we know that uh, uh, a lot of uh, patients, we don't know where is the mutation. So, so there's about 15% of patients that uh, you can't find the the cause and, and we call them de novo mutation as well. So we don't know wh where the mutation is. So uh, that's important. Uh, so these are modifying factors for uh, uh, cystic uh, uh, formation as well. Regardless of what happened, and this is really a very busy slide, and I'm just gonna tell you what happened when you have uh, low dose of polycystin and the, the, the one thing that we know for sure, all of these uh, signaling pathways that are disturbed, but, but one that we know for sure that you have a low calcium because you can't really transport calcium if you have mutation uh, 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 into the cell. And if you have low calcium, 
by different pathway, you have increased cyclic MEB. So uh, we know that uh, calcium inhibit the formation of uh, cyclic MEB uh, by inhibiting the ad adenyl cyclase uh, 6, but also by different pathways, uh, uh, you have, so the center stage here is cyclic MEB is increased and that lead to uh, protein kinase A that is increased and then you have the cystic fibrosis uh, uh, receptor or the chloride channel that gets activated and that's how you secrete your, your chloride into the cyst and you make fluid. Uh, obviously when you have cyclic AMB that is activated, you also insert the aquaborin into the apical membrane and the aquaborin obviously uh, will transport water. So you have uh, those will, will lead to a formation of fluid inside the cyst. So uh, cyclic AMB, protein kinase A and, and the cystic fibrosis uh, uh, receptor with the chloride channel uh, those are definitely increased. We know that there is a lot of uh, increase in a lot of transcription factors as well that is involved in a growth factor formation that obviously is needed also for the cyst formation. But one, one important thing that uh, is, is really reduced is the AMB protein kinase or adenine monophosphate protein kinase. And we'll get back to this because, because obviously this is important uh, uh, and uh, in inhibiting the chloride channel. So, so when you have this is reduced, you can actually uh, uh, increase the chloride uh, transport as well. Uh, as I told you, there's uh, increased glycolysis. This is the Warburg uh, pathway that we discussed. Uh, there is a mammalian uh, uh, target of rabomycin is also upregulated. So there is a lot of things here and, and it just give you an idea about how complex this uh, disease with uh, uh, a dose of PCI that, uh, or the polycystin that no one knows until today what is the function of polycystin one uh, for now. If you wanna have the summary slide, uh, just to uh, give you, uh, so you have the germline mutation in BKD1 and BKD2, and this can be, the mutation can be truncating, which you don't make the protein, uh, so the dose is very low, or non-truncating missense mutation, for, exam for example. Uh, so you make a little bit of uh, the BC1, so that's probably less severe. Uh, so that will decrease the dose uh, for each tubular cell, and then you get uh, somatic mutation or you get uh, some modifying genes that we discussed, uh, like the DGP11 or LDG9. Uh, and these will uh, lead to uh, uh, apparent uh, cellular signaling pathway. We discussed the cyclic AMB, mTOR, ERK, all these transcription factors. But this is, as I said, this is, uh, there is a reduction in AMB kinase or uh, adenine monophosphate kinase. And this will, uh, 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 result in clonal expansion, cyst growth, and then there's the snow if, snowball effect, which is really like you make uh, oxalate or calcium crystal that lead to obstruction. There is inflammatory process that you can see, uh, even uh, regional ischemia, uh, metabolic reprogramming or rewiring, the increased glycolytic pathway. All of these uh, are uh, 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 impacting the cyst growth as well. So. It's not easy. We know that there's a, a genetic mutation, but there's a lot of things that happen actually that make that mutation translate into uh, a polycystic kidney disease uh, in a patient. I told you that there is a lot of uh, variability in presentation, and obviously we know that BKD1 is more severe than BKD2. Uh, the variant, if it's truncating, which really stop the formation of the, uh, of the protein, and, and that will lead to more severe uh, disease compared to a non-truncating uh, truncating, uh, mutation. The timing of the gene act inactivation is also important. For instance, if you take a, a, a mouse and you inactivate the uh, BKD1 before age 13 uh, uh, day, before 13 days uh, of birth, uh, after birth, uh, you will have a very severe disease. Uh, on the other hand, if you inactivate the BKD1 after day 13, uh, you have a very mild disease. So the timing of gene inactivation 
uh, will give you a different uh, uh, presentation. Genetic background, modifying genes, and environmental factors. Obviously, we don't know what are these, and we call it a stochastic uh, uh, factors or random events that we don't know what it is. So not only the, the locus of uh, BKD1 versus BKD2, so the, this is a BKD1 mutation versus BKD2 uh, mutation. Uh, just gonna take this out of here. Uh, the, uh, uh, not only the locus of mutation, but also the position of mutation in, in BKD1. So if you have a mutation in the five prime position, it gives you more severe disease and also more uh, aneurysm, intracranial aneurysm, and more uh, rupture. Uh, so that's more than the mutation that happened uh, at the three prime end. Uh, you have uh, mosaicism, and so you have two different uh, genotype uh, uh, cells. So one cell has uh, 46 chromosomes, and the other cell has 47, for instance. So different uh, uh, impact, and you can see here this is. Uh, <coughs> uh, is in, in a unilateral BKD patient. Uh, so you, you, the one kidney is totally normal and the other one has uh, cystic disease. And this is, by the way, this is a patient without mutation at all, although he has uh, 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 left uh, cystic disease, but genetic uh, analysis showed that uh, 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 there was no mutation. The other thing is, uh, BKD1 gene is on chromosome 16, as I mentioned earlier. The tuberous sclerosis gene also on chromosome 16. So you can be very unlucky and you have the two mutation in affecting BKD1 and uh, tuberous sclerosis gene. So you can have actually not just cystic disease, but you can have angiomyolibomas in the kidneys uh, as well. So that makes it uh, a lot difficult uh, uh, patient to treat as well. So if we look at the natural history of uh, cystic uh, growth in patients with uh, BKD, uh, this is a recent study and it really uh, included patients from the CRISP the trial, which was a consortium among nephrologists and, and uh, radiologists looking at imaging studies of patients with uh, uh, BKD-1 and BKD2. Uh, so those were 236 patients. This is their age at baseline. And they had uh, basically follow-up of 14 years. And they had during the follow-up uh, six MRIs. And they looked at really the cyst growth, the number of cysts by MRI, and also the cyst volume. And uh, comparing uh, no mutation or BKD2 mutation as a reference to a truncating mutation and non-truncating mutation. As, as you expect, uh, the baseline, uh, you have 762 cysts in those patients uh, that over 14 years more than doubled, uh, uh, so 17, uh, 15. And obviously, if you have a truncating mutation, you are more likely to uh, make more cysts compared to those with non-truncating. And obviously, the reference is no mutation here. So again, we know that those patients will, will start to have growth in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cysts and growth in the volume. And the CRISP trial really was the uh, key for how to monitor these patients and uh, how to put them in either treatment uh, uh, protocol or clinical trial protocol. So how we diagnose uh, polycystic kidney disease, and obviously these are very uh, commonly asked questions, uh, and I'm sure all of you uh, know about this. Now, it's a key that you have a family history before you decide about the imaging, because if you don't have a family history, it becomes a problem. Uh, so if there is a family history of PKD, the imaging will be very uh, useful. And we use the RAVEN criteria, which is the current standard. Uh, and obviously, the, uh, the ultrasound criteria is for ADBKD, if you are between the age of 15 and 39, and you have more than three cysts, three cysts or more, the positive predictive value is, a, is 100%. Between 40 and 59, uh, you need uh, uh, two uh, or more per kidney for each kidney, and the positive predictive value, predictive value, uh, value would be 
Now, you cannot exclude patients who have no cyst between age 15 and 39. So you cannot really say if I have a negative, even if you have a family, uh, if you have a family history and you have a negative ultrasound between age 15 up to 40, basically you cannot tell the patients, and that's important for donation because you cannot say to the patients you can donate uh, uh, your kidney safely, and and uh, if you have between uh, age 40 and 59 uh, less than two cysts that will be a good negative predictive value. So those patients between age, uh, after age 40, if you have less than two cysts, uh, definitely you are okay. The MRI can be very helpful for confirmation because the MRI obviously will detect uh, smaller cysts. So, so you can, and the positive predictive value between 16 and 40. So you can here see between 15 and 39 instead of three, you see by MRI more than 10, and for exclusion, less than five. So you can, between 16 and 40, if you wanna actually exclude the patients and you wanna consider this patients for donation, the negative predictive value by MRI is 100%. So we use ultrasound for the initial diagnosis, but follow up is definitely MRI. Uh, um, you can use CT, but MRI is, is definitely much better. Uh, and we use the total kidney volume as a, as, a, as a marker for progression and clinical endpoints now is considered the clinical endpoint by the FDA uh, to treat patients and uh, follow them. <clears throat> and this is uh, coming from the CRISP trial. Again, this is a consortium between radiologists and nephrologists uh, to uh, look at the growth of the kidneys over time and the TKV is, is really is now established as a way to monitor these patients. Complication is CAT scan, MRI for hemorrhage and tumor, uh, PET scan or uh, white blood cell scan for infection, as you know that these are common uh, in patients. Uh, again, the progression of a patients with uh, polycystic kidney disease, if you have a BKD1, uh, so everything goes up, this is a total kidney volume, TKV, and basically uh, it goes up with time and then you uh, fall down by age 50, 50% 50 of patients will end up on dialysis. So what is really the TKV? And that uh, the, the total kidney volume classification now that is used as a standard is the Mayo classification. So you have five, uh, class, uh, five stages, uh, class A, 1A, and 1B, C, D, and E. So if you have class C, D, or E, you have a very progressive disease, and those are the patients that need intervention. If you have a class A or B, those are the patients that you can monitor and apply their treatment as I'm gonna discuss. So just to give you an idea. So if you fall into class 1A, the uh, estimated kidney growth uh, uh, by per year is less than 1.5%. So your total kidney volume is going to increase by less than 1.5% per year. So you, you fall into this uh, mild disease. If you are 1B, it's, the volume is going to increase by 1.5 to 3%, and that's intermediate disease. But if you have C or D or E, you're going to go above three to 4.5, 4.5 to 6%, 6% if you are 1E. And that's really important because you can predict based on the total kidney volume, uh, what, is, what is the end point for your patient if not treated. And those are the ones that need to be treated. So that's really the indication for treatment now. And those are monitoring. So here is some example. If you take uh, patients uh, uh, at 41, and this is class, three patients, one is in class A, one in class C, one in class E. So you can look at them and you can project what's gonna happen to those patients at age 41, how they're gonna end uh, 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 over time. And you can see the kidney by MRI. So here is, a very nice way of looking at some patients who started, this is the y-axis with AGFR, 
So if they start all of them at 75, so you have a patient who is 41 years old or 44 in this example, and you start this patient at 75, and you can tell the patients based on the TTV how, what time frame they're going to end up on dialysis. So if you have the worst case scenario, which is E, if you fall into here, you're going to end up on dialysis in about 11 years. So this is a 44 years old. You know that they're going to end up on dialysis in about 11 years based on their TKV. On the other hand, if they are uh, uh, D, they're going to actually extend their kidney function up to about 15 plus year, almost 15, 16 years. Okay. On the other hand, if you have C, it's going to take about 19 years. So you can say, well, so you are 44 and 20 years uh, at so 64 or so, you're going to require dialysis. So that's why those patients will require intervention. On the other hand, if you have B or C, you can see that the trajectory of the decline in GFR is going to be really much less uh, uh, compared to uh, those three. And this is a donor. So this is a donor kidney, and you can see that trajectory as well of, uh, of, of uh, patients uh, who donated the kidney, and that's really uh, their GFR over time as well. So, so how do we uh, uh, look at uh, one of examples of uh, one of uh, patients uh, who's 41 years old, old female, creatinine is one, but her TKV volume is 36, uh, uh, 100 ml per meter square, and this is really will make her fall into E. I mean, you can, uh, this is huge, right? And basically, if you uh, tell this patient, it's gonna obviously, she's gonna progress over time quickly to end the stage renal disease. So, how do we calculate this? Because obviously, I can tell you calculate your TKV. Most MRI software can calculate the total TKV volume. So that you have to do the, um, uh, uh, take this section of the MRI, you have a sagittal view, you have a coronal view, and you measure the right, so this is the right uh, kidney, the sagittal, and you plug it into, this is really online, uh, you plug the numbers, uh, but the MRIs, some of the MRIs have the software to calculate it for you. So this is the, uh, the sagittal view for the right kidney. You calculate this, the left kidney, and then you get the coronal uh, length uh, for right kidney, left kidney, and then you get the, uh, the depth and the width of, of the kidney on a cross-sectional. And you basically <clears throat> plug all these numbers here and you have to be, uh, put the patient height and the age. And really, the, because this is we call a height uh, 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 adjusted TKV. So that's why the height is important in meter, the patient age, and then you calculate the height adjusted TKV, and it will give you 3256. So it will put this patient in 1E, and then if the patients, you can enter the patient, uh, uh, serum creatinine and the age, and you can tell the patients they're going to end up on dialysis in 9.6 years. So that's really how how we put uh, the patient information now in uh, 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 using the TKB. Now, the caveat is that this is only for classic BKD, meaning that you have really this two kidneys with the polycystic kidney disease that you see and you can calculate the volume. You cannot use it in a typical presentation. And these are a typical presentation. You cannot use it in unilateral BKD or segmental BKD or asymmetric BKD. And obviously, uh, 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 the low-sided uh, BKD. Uh, so, so, so these are shrunken uh, BKD patients. And uh, I can tell you that uh, this patient uh, had DNAG11 uh, mutation. So you cannot use it in this atypical uh, presentation. Again, this is a, a unilateral uh, form of BKD here, and you cannot use the uh, Mayo Clinic classification. Uh, luckily, not 
the majority of patients have the classic presentation, but you're going to have to really uh, uh, deal with these atypical presentations as well in, in, in the patients that sometimes come to your clinic. So what are the therapy? All right, so now you remember we, we discussed uh, these signaling pathway, pathways that are activated uh, for the most part. Uh, so you have the cyclic MB protein kinase A and you have the, the cystic fiber process channel that uh, lead to chloride uh, uh, transport here. You have the uh, uh, mTOR that gets activated. Uh, you have the uh, activation of uh, adenyl cyclase and really one of the uh, uh, new studies or the uh, recent studies that looked at some of these pathways uh, were disappointing. So if you look at uh, mTOR, mTOR was very successful in animal model in preventing uh, uh, cystic uh, progression. Uh, so rabamycin was very good in animals, but in animal we use it for 14 days and very high doses, high doses that cannot be tolerated uh, in human, you cannot use these high doses. And also uh, the short term uh, application in animals is different from a human that you're gonna apply it for, for life, basically, if you're gonna use mTOR uh, inhibitor. So uh, obviously you know that the rabamycin failed a clinical trial. Uh, two clinical trials using uh, somatostatin analogs also to inhibit the adenyl uh, cyclase and uh, both uh, failed. Uh, Aladdin was one of them. Uh, both were, I believe, uh, published in Lancet, and uh, they both failed. And I think the effect of somatostatin analog was transient, and that's why it didn't work. I mean, so you lose actually the efficacy after a while, and that's why it, it looks like uh, uh, the uh, uh, inhibition of cyclic MB formation. Is, is only transient with these analogs. So we came to the uh, V2 uh, antagonist, which obviously if you inhibit the V2 receptor, which uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, also uh, activate the uh, uh, adenyl uh, uh, cyclase and form uh, cyclic MB. So if you inhibit the V2 receptor, you can inhibit the formation of cyclic MB. And th there have been uh, uh, good successful trials. Uh, so the, 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 these are the trials that uh, showed the beneficial effect of the uh, V2 receptor antagonist, the tempo 3 4 and this was uh, 1445 patients. Uh, this is an early stage patients, so JFR was more than 60. And uh, again, we use uh, TKV growth, and this was, uh, uh, the impact was very good, half 50% uh, decline in the growth and also the uh, change in GFR decline was uh, reduced by 27%. So it was uh, uh, working in early stage. Uh, this is uh, a table 4.4, which was open label follow-up. Uh, and again, the effect on uh, growth was also uh, very good, especially in the first year. So the impact is usually, you see most of this impact uh, uh, is in the first year, but the effect on GFR loss was also durable. So meaning that during prolonged treatment, you uh, actually sustained the effect of V2 uh, receptor antagonist on GFR uh, loss. And then the reprise trial in 2017, 1370, and this was in later stage. So GFR between 25 and 65. And again, the loss was uh, in GFR was reduced by 35%. So it looks like at least in, in early and late stage uh, using V2 receptor uh, uh, blocker uh, is effective. And this was uh, in a smaller study for long period of follow-up, 11.2 uh, years. So this is probably the longest uh, uh, open label long-term long follow-up. Again, the change of, uh, in GFR loss was reduced by 37%. So, Right now, we use uh, uh, the V2 receptor antagonist for a stage, uh, as I said, C, D, and E. You cannot, we don't use it for A or B, but so you have to do the MRI, and that's how you can monitor your patients based on, on these studies. One problem with the V2 receptor blocker, obviously, is polyuria, and one thing that you have to tell your patients, they have to drink a lot of water because 
uh, because uh, you can see that uh, uh, if you look at the amount of uh, urine on the full dose of, of B2 receptor is really uh, can be almost uh, nine liter a day. So you have to be really uh, uh, careful when you prescribe these medications because you have to tell your patients you have to drink as much as, as you can. Uh, but also uh, you have to lower the or smaller load to decrease urine volume so because you know that urine volume is uh, driven by the osmolar intake for sure. So protein and salt, if you reduce the osmolar load uh, in these patients, you can lower the urine volume. So that's uh, the two advices that you give uh, your patients when you give uh, tolbactam or uh, a V2 receptor blocker. Uh, liberal intake of uh, water, uh, water, not any other drink. Uh, and also one of the things that uh, although coffee is good for, for mostly CKD patients and, and, and a lot of other disorders, caffeine is not a good idea for BKD patients because uh, it activates the cyclic MAB as well. So, so uh, that's the only uh, uh, time I tell my patients to uh, limit their coffee uh, consumption. Uh, for BTD, uh, but otherwise I, I let them drink coffee. That's no problem. Um, now, <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm gonna apologize, but this is really I'm gonna tell you that the uh, uh, SN invited all uh, researcher on BKD to come up with druggable uh, targets for uh, adult uh, polycystic kidney disease. So they actually give them this uh, uh, product. So this is really what they get. So Greg Germino, uh, Vicente Torre, and Peter Harris, all of these people came together and say, these are the targets that we want to actually explore to treat uh, uh, patients with PKD. So beside the B2 receptor uh, uh, antagonist, uh, which is here, and obviously this is failed, uh, and the M2, uh, M2 inhibitor failed, uh, these are other uh, places where you can actually try to uh, uh, include in future clinical trial. So I'm just going to give you a, a focused view on what is being done right now because, because obviously this is a very busy slide, so I don't want you to, uh, to remember any of that except the, the fact that there is a lot of pathways that you can actually intervene and help. Uh, so the one, the one thing that really is, is uh, fascinating is uh, uh, this uh, transcription factor, NERF2. And NERF2 is, we call it the master transcription factor for the cell to defend itself against the oxidative uh, of the stress. So this is really number one transcription factor. So this is the master. And but this transcription factor is sequestered in the cytoplasm by this protein, uh, uh, which is called KIB. It's a Kelch protein. And the KIB attaches to the nerve 2 and if you're not going to use it, it gets really degraded like anything in the cell. I mean, you cannot just keep things uh, uh, run them in, inside the cytoplasm. You have to degrade them if you're not going to use them. And so KIB is, is really attached to the nerve 2 and undergoes uh, proteasomal degradation. Now, if you have any oxidative stress, that will uh, detach KIB from the nerve 2 and nerve 2 will be translocated into the nucleus and it will activate a lot of uh, uh, target genes that are really uh, important for antioxidation, glutathione transferase and so on. But, but this, is, this is a very important uh, uh, transcription factor that we use, and you can actually increase antioxidation yourself uh, uh, by eating some of, uh, of the uh, uh, vegetables that uh, can uh, inhibit the keep. So there are vegetables that inhibit the keep uh, that uh, I'm gonna discuss in a little bit. This is a, a study that uh, just came out uh, I believe uh, this month from China and they looked at the activation of NERF2 
uh, in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease in animal model. So, so if you look here, this is a BKD1 uh, mouse that has, uh, um, uh, that has uh, it's a wild type, so it has uh, the wild type gene, and also it has NERF2 uh, wild type. Now, if you take the NERF2, so if you do genetic mutation, so this will be heterozygous, and still BKD1 is a wild type, and this is BKD1 wild type, but if you delete uh, NERF2 uh, heterozygous deletion, or full deletion, you can see that the size of the kidney almost unchanged. But now if you have a mutated mouse that lacks the BKD1, uh, and here you have the NERF2, so this is the size of your kidney, as an animal, if you delete the NERF2 from that animal, that's the size of, of, the, uh, of the kidney. So meaning that if you have no NERF2, you have actually increase in the kidney size. And you can see by H and E, when you do cross-sectional, that the animal that have no BKD and also genetically deleted NERF2, the cystic formation has increased significantly. So that's one uh, of the experiment. The other experiment was, so what happened if I actually activate NERF2? So this is the wild type again, and the wild type here on the top, and here NERF2 activation by giving this uh, uh, substance that comes actually naturally from uh, uh, cruciferous uh, vegetables. You know that cruciferous vegetables like cabbage and broccoli, it has this natural uh, uh, substance that actually inhibit the keep uh, one. So the kelch, the one that degrade NERF2 is actually inhibited by these cruciferous uh, vegetables. So if you, del if you have a, 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 a mouse that has no BKD1 and then you add basically the uh, cruciferous uh, vegetable or substance is called SFN uh, you can see that the size of the kidney actually goes down. So this is uh, without treatment, this is with treatment. Even if it's a heterozygous NERF2 deletion, so you can still have a response. Obviously, if you don't have NERF2 at all, you are not gonna affect the size of the kidney. So you have to have NERF2 first, and then you inhibit KEEP. And basically, once you inhibit KEEP, you actually uh, delay the progression of uh, uh, cystic formation. And this is here on the MRI of these uh, animals. You can see basically uh, this is a wild type. Again, this is a vehicle. This is a SFN treated, and there will be no difference here. Uh, but here in the uh, mutated animal uh, kidneys, uh, adding uh, the SFN, you can see the difference uh, in kidney size, except obviously if you have no NERF2. But this is even heterozygous. This is PKD1 uh, uh, mutated. You can see almost the same size as a normal kidney. So this is exciting. And not only that, because we are doing now phase uh, three trial, uh, looking at uh, NERF2 activator, which is paradoxolone. You remember paradoxolone failed in diabetic kidney disease because of heart failure, not because it didn't work, just because there was a lot of uh, heart failure patients uh, but Bardoxolone is a known uh, drug that activates uh, NERF2, and we are now enrolling patients in phase three uh, uh, to see if really giving Bardoxolone will delay the progression of autosomal uh, dominant kidney disease. So this is ongoing right now. The other target that have been uh, uh, also uh, uh, happening uh, right now is also inhibition of uh, the metabolic uh, rewiring. So uh, you remember the Warburg effect and the increased glycolysis, you can actually inhibit glycolysis by different ways, uh, by the uh, T-dextrose uh, or TD uh, glucose, which uh, this is really, when it goes to the cell, it, it fake the cell, but it doesn't really go into glycolysis at all. So that actually, uh, the D-glucose is inhibitor of glycolysis, uh, dietary restriction. You can also remember the uh, AMB kinase, 
<coughs> the adenine monophosphate uh, uh, kinase that is really reduced in patients with uh, PBKD, you can actually activate that and, and that will also uh, increase oxidative phosphorylation. It will increase also the, uh, or it will inhibit the chloride channel, the cystic fibrosis channel. Uh, we know that rabamycin doesn't does work, but you can actually inhibit the mTORC uh, pathway by dietary restriction uh, uh, as well. There is these receptors, uh, the BPAR receptors, which uh, uh, stimulate uh, uh, lipid oxidation. Uh, these are transcription factors that actually, when activated, it, uh, it increases beta oxidation. So it actually forces the cell to go into the TSA. And we have drugs that works on that. The phenofibrate is one of them. And also, uh, some of the hypoglycemic agents that, that are on the market. So you can repurpose these uh, drugs to treat patients with uh, BKD. So the rosiglitazone uh, is, is available on the market to also activate the PPAR receptors. Uh, and therefore, you can increase that beta oxidation. So I'm going to tell you what is uh, going on with these uh, type of metabolic uh, rewiring uh, pathways. And so there is, uh, and, and the, all of these uh, strategy have been used in non-BKD patients and mostly in animal model of BKD, but there, is clinical, there are clinical trials right now uh, doing, uh, for instance, uh, caloric restriction in patients with uh, BKD, intermittent fasting with the BKD, uh, time restricted only in animals have been done. Uh, I told you about the MEB, uh, the uh, adenine monophosphate kinase activator, and we know that uh, metformin activate MEB kinase. We know that statin also activate the MEB kinase. Uh, so there are two clinical trials now uh, using metformin, which is again a, a, another uh, drug that is on the market. So you purpose, you purpose uh, that agent to uh, activate the MMB kinase in BKD patients. So statin also, there's a clinical trial on statin in BKD patients. This is still uh, in the work. Uh, nothing uh, is going on in, in BKD patients. Uh, it has been tried in animals. It has conflicting results, the sodium glucose transporter inhibitors. And then the, there is this sirtuin, uh, uh, which is activated in BKD patients. And this can be inhibited by niacinamide uh, sirtuin is an uh, energy sensor, uh, and basically, uh, if you can inhibit th that uh, uh, protein by niacinamide, and this is also uh, uh, a clinical trial that is being done right now. And then the PPAR activator, as I told you, the, we have phenofibrate, we have the uh, hyperglycemic agents. Uh, and these uh, uh, are also in trial for BKD patients. So in addition to... Uh, this is not an exclusive list, by the way. There is microRNA trial that is using uh, uh, microRNA seventeen, uh, which, as you know, these small RNA are uh, regulator of uh, uh, protein transcription. So uh, one of them is microRNA seventeen is being uh, 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 tried now in in BK patients. Uh, there is also some of the other metabolic pathways that have been uh, uh, tested. But these are, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, drugs that is available on the market, not new drugs that can be actually uh, suited uh, for some of these patients. So what do we do? So this is, you have a renal cyst and you have to have a family history to confirm the diagnosis. And then this is the typical or the classical one, which is bilateral diffuse cyst distribution. You measure the uh, kidney volume, we prefer MRI, and then you classify it into C, D, E, or A or B. If you have the last uh, three classes you have, and the patient is above 18, each of are above 25, you have uh, the option of treating those patients because you know that they're gonna progress fast. On the other hand, if you have class 1A or B or the atypical ones uh, of ADBKD because we don't know what to do with them yet, uh, those are the one that, uh, you know, that the goal, uh, blood pressure, this is uh, based on the whole trial uh, that looked at uh, blood pressure uh, intensive versus uh, um, uh, conventional uh, blood pressure. But if you have a GFR above 60, 
the uh, tight blood pressure control less than 110 over 75. The whole showed that this is a better target for GFR above 60. Uh, but uh, if you have a GFR less than 60, that's your goal for, for blood pressure. Uh, we like to maintain the osmolarity because drinking water inhibits also ADH. So if you are not going to use uh, a V2 receptor, uh, at least uh, inhibit the uh, uh, V2 by water. Uh, so that's uh, and spread the, the, the water over the day, uh, over time. Obviously, you are not going to, you don't want patients to get uh, acute hyponatremia. So you, you have to be careful. Uh, when you tell them to drink a lot, you don't want patients don't eat and also drink a lot uh, because you have to advise them about low osmolar intake, which is sodium restriction and protein restriction, uh, obviously uh, are very important. Uh, the other thing that really uh, is also important is statin because uh, as I told you, statin uh, also activate the uh, AMB uh, kinase, which uh, uh, has been helpful in, in, in patients or an animal model but is being tested in human now. So <clears throat> these are the uh, monitoring for the atypical ADPKD patients or patients with class 1 and B. Now the majority of BKD1 patients will fall into uh, these classes unfortunately. BKD2 on the other hand the majority of them will fall into the class 1A uh, or 1B. So that's really important to know that your patients, if you have BKD1, are likely to need treatment. So these are really the uh, points that I tried to take you through uh, a journey of 15 years of research on since the discovery or the cloning of the BKD1 and, and, and BKD2. And really the important uh, issue is that the uh, phenotypic variability uh, in, in those patients and also uh, the progression of the disease is, is, should be monitored by uh, TTB. So I'm going to stop here and be happy to take questions. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you very much, Professor Atta, for this very nice illuminating and brainstorming presentation. In our practice, we are missing the genetic testing yeah, and I think I think you will you will have many questions about uh, uh, should we do them routine to diagnose. Uh, so I would like to leave uh, the floor to the uh, to the professor Ayman Rafai to have his comments and then uh, the to, to answer the question in the chat and then to leave the audience to ask you and then I'm going to have a few comments at the end. Dr. Ayman, uh, until yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Atta, for okay, Dr. Thank you very much for this, this very elegant and comprehensive uh, talk about this uh, very important subject. Uh, I think uh, your presentation is stimulating for uh, a lot of questions by the audience. Uh, but let me ask you uh, in the start a, a, a very practical question. Uh, as you know, one of the challenges uh, that we are facing frequently in our uh, transplantation practice is uh, <clears throat> the safe donation and selection of uh, a living related uh, kidney donor for a transplant candidate with polycystic kidney disease. So uh, could you please clarify the updated criteria uh, of safe selection of such donors and do we need uh, to do any genetic uh, testing for such patients? So yeah, what's me. the criteria for the yeah. age or the, uh, the preferred uh, imaging modality and uh, uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, so, so the, the, let me just tackle the issue of genetic testing because it comes uh, a lot of time about genetic testing, especially when when there's uh, family history and uh, when there's donation, and even if you don't have family history, whether you should do it or not. Well, we don't really recommend genetic testing because, uh, as I as I showed you and I alluded to, that the gene is so difficult to navigate, and uh, 
and you have a lot of these pseudogenes and you can have false positive and false negative results. Never uh, trust the, unless you have a very uh, good uh, lab that does very uh, focused. Uh, there are uh, now uh, technology to really uh, tease out uh, those uh, pseudogenes from uh, or, or the duplicated uh, uh, area of the gene uh, from the real ones. And therefore, most commercial labs that, that, that uh, do genetic testing are not sophisticated enough to really give you uh, the, the good idea. So you can have a patient who wants to donate or a donor who wants to donate the kidney and then you get uh, a genetic test that tells you it's positive, but actually it may not be positive. On the other hand, it can be negative and it may not be negative, right? So that's really the, the, the challenge uh, in, in that area. So, so we generally say, if you have a, a donor that is above age 40, that's safe to say if by ultrasound you have uh, less than two cysts by ultrasound, and, and uh, uh, if you wanna do MRI and they have less than five cysts by MRI, you can safely say those patients are unlikely to develop uh, uh, really uh, uh, BKD or progressive disease. So that's, uh, that's really the, the, the key. Be below age 40, it becomes really a problem uh, to uh, uh, take uh, patients as a donor because uh, as I showed you that even if you don't have any cysts by ultrasound, uh, you are not gonna rule out 100% that those patients don't have BKD. You can do the MRI in that case, and if they have more than 10 cysts, you know that they have BKD. So, so, so I think the recommendation is family history. If they have family history, I assume that the donor is, uh, wants to donate to someone with BKD, so they have family history. So obviously, uh, if, uh, the age is going to be a, a determinant for whether you take that patient in or not. If the age is above 40, you are safe if you have no cysts or less than two cysts by ultrasound or less than five cysts by MRI, you're safe to take that kidney. But below that, you have to do MRI if the age is 30. You do MRI, you have to see where, how many cysts they have, if they have more than 10, because ultrasound obviously is not very sensitive. So, so if you have more than 10, you have the diagnosis of BKD and you don't have to take that donor. But, but there's obviously this gray area where you are not gonna be able to, uh, to, to figure out whether they have BKD. So age is, is, is a very key in, 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 in deciding whether to take the kidney or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, away from the polycystic kidney disease, by the way, if, if you have a donor with, uh, with renal cysts, uh, would you count on the uh, number of cysts or bilaterality? I mean, if, we ha if you have a donor with two cysts in the right kidney, three cysts in the left kidney, uh, could you accept such donor away from the history and away from the polycystic kidney disease in general? Yeah, so, so again, uh, we, we, we have the, the positive predictive value for ultrasound. Okay. Uh, the, the problem is that Again, without family history, you can obviously there is very small number of patients who can have de novo mutation and start yeah. a new tree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have a small kidney, I mean like a normal size kidney, and you have one cyst in, in, a, in, in an individual with, uh, who is 30 years old, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider this uh, an exclusion criteria to uh, to donate the kidney, okay. like. And I, I, I really, I think that less than three cysts probably is acceptable. Yes. Okay. Dr. Hussain, would you... Uh... Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Atta. And uh, I prefer now to have the question in the chat, then yes. uh, to have the comments of the professors and the guests. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Hadiri, the, 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 uh, the coordinator of the meeting, and you can read the question in the chat. Please, Mohamed Hadiri. Uh, the first question uh, is asking about whether tulvartan is used uh, in practice for the treatment of uh, BKD or is it just uh, used as a clinical trial? Is it no, it is, it is used. It has been uh, it has been approved in Europe and the United States 
in, uh, to be used in, in patients. Again, uh, based on the classification, only C, D, and E, uh, Mayo classification. So in the classic form of EDPTD with the uh, uh, stage uh, C, D, and E, we use it uh, on, on, those, uh, on these patients, unless they are in clinical trials, for sure, for other products. But uh, yeah, we use it. And, uh, and excuse me for just a, a comment on this point. I know that is the magic drug. And uh, in certain time point, there was a, a fear of uh, uh, liver disease and liver dysfunction. But nowadays, it is standard of care based upon the, uh, the predicted risk of progression of polycystic kidney disease, as you mentioned. But the major problem in Egypt and the major barrier in Egypt and broadly African countries and the majority of the developing countries, the cost. Yes. Because it is costly drug. And the second point is the polyuric effect or uh, the diuresis that occur with this drug. You mentioned elegantly how to reduce the diuresis by respecting salt and the protein diet, especially during the evening to reduce uh, polyuria. But the cost is a real uh, problem. This is why I routine advise uh, all patients with polycystic kidney disease who had a GFR above 30 milliliter per minute is to uh, uh, follow the advice you mentioned during the presentation is to drink water during the, all the day and probably early in the night before they sleep. Because by this way, this is a physiological uh, uh, way to reduce antidiuretic hormone and giving the the, the, the sense of um, uh, the two receptor antagonists. I want to, to just to, uh, from you to, to focus on this point, please. Yeah. Regarding water uh, drinking. I, I, think, I think that the best way to uh, uh, get the cost down is to speak to the company. Because once you say, well, I have this number of patients and I have this uh, potential uh, uh, revenue for the company if you actually reduce the cost. And uh, I think Egypt has been very successful in different areas in, in really getting drugs at reduced costs. You need a lobby uh, with the drug company uh, to actually give you a special uh, uh, cost or a special cost for the Middle East, for instance, because, because obviously once, once you have a lot of patients to use a drug, that will make and because if the company doesn't reduce the cost, they are not going to make any revenue. So it's, it's you are really right because you are right because we enjoyed the management of hepatitis C by direct antiviral drug. Right. When when it taken as a campaign and the cost is significantly reduced, then we succeeded to treat many patients with hepatitis C. And right. I hope that in the near future, uh, Egypt will be free of HCV. I hope so. Yeah, uh, the, the, obviously the other side is that, I mean, hep C was very common uh, compared to PKD. Well, says, with, yes. uh, you have 12 million people worldwide of PKD compared to hepatitis C, which really uh, uh, worldwide uh, uh, distribution is very huge. So it's a huge market. But I think, I think you still can make the case about really including not just Egypt, but also the Middle East African countries in, into a program that can actually provide uh, a special uh, pricing uh, scheme for, for patients with PTD. I think the price in US, uh, one month, it cost about uh, 13,000 uh, US dollars, nearly. Yeah, 14,000. Right. Yeah. How much? 14,000. 14,000 for a month. So it is impossible okay. for us if it is like yeah. this. So what about water drinking and how to use maxima, it's it maximally? Yeah. Well, so, so, so first of all, we don't have a study on the water, right? The only yes. study on water drinking was uh, the wet trial. And the wet trial was not an ex exclusive trial in BKD patients, it was actually in CKD patients in general whether drinking more water actually will delay progression of CKD and this failed. The WIT trial didn't actually show beneficial effect of drinking water. But uh, if we think that uh, the central uh, 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 molecule Sorry. involved in CKD progression, which is cyclic MAB, 
and B2 receptor. So uh, it definitely makes a lot of uh, physiological sense to, to actually increase water intake. But again, we have to distribute the time of water uh, consumption. Um, and as, I, as you mentioned, uh, you, you, you drink also before, I mean, obviously if you drink before you sleep, you, you're gonna go to the oh. bathroom in the middle of the night, but oh. that's the best time to inhibit ADH as well. Uh, uh, so, so you have to be careful with the with the water consumption because of the uh, the potential impact on sodium as well. So, so you have to make sure that the patients understand that they cannot drink four liters in, in one sitting. <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> way in, in, in the United States, somebody drank uh, within one hour four liter and died. The idea that behind drinking water is to lower down the urine osmolality, right? Yes. The, uh, better be, be below 280, yeah, right? Well, I mean, you, so you, should you, lower, it, you water? lower it with water and you lower it with the osmolar intake as yeah. well. So the sodium so, low protein. Okay. Should we monitor the urine osmolality? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. I think so, so there is an there is a very fantastic equation if we have a patient to know it's uh, his osmolarity now and then uh, calculate how many uh, centimeter of water or uh, cc water to be added or liters of water to be added per day to bring the urine uh, to uh, as isocenteric to avoid uh, overdrawing because as you uh, you mentioned it may be very difficult to drink a lot of water for certain patients but yeah. uh, although, as you mentioned, it was not tested in a big uh, randomized controlled trial, and there is a small study that was negative, but this is what we do to our patients to advise them, so long as I am not afraid of water intoxication, and it is modest drinking of water to just to be added. If I add one liter or one and a half liter to uh, the, the amount of uh, water it, I think it is not a difficult issue. And the most important is distribute water drinking and to reduce cut down salt. Yeah, and obviously use statin as well. As I said, yes. the patient is diabetic. Metformin would be a good uh, glucophage, which is available as well. So yes. these are uh, other things that one can do in the absence of uh, a targeted treatment. Okay, Dr. Hadidi, please, the, the next question. Dr. Next question from uh, Dr. Imad Khater. He's asking about the best diagnostic method to exclude polycystic kidney disease for potential kidney donors, especially if their uh, related recipients have polycystic kidney disease. Uh, should it uh, be done by MRI, genetic testing, ultrasound? Yeah. Again, so we'll go through the, uh, the age number one. So if the age is above 40, the donor, potential donor is uh, age above 40 and if you want to do ultrasound, the ultrasound has less than two cysts. You can accept that donor uh, without a problem. You can also, obviously, if, if the uh, you can do MRI and the MRI also if the, uh, the the cystic number or the cyst numbers is less than five, that would be 100% negative predictive value for EDDTD. So, so that you can do either one. Uh, ultrasound, depending on, on uh, your preference, uh, is cheap and easy to do. And if you have, I mean, I would start with ultrasound. I would uh, uh, obviously keep the MRI for things that I am really not sure whether the ultrasound really was accurate or not. And I look at the ultrasound myself to make sure as well. Um, so I look at the cysts. Uh, if there are no cysts and you are above 40, you are clear. Uh, or if you have less than two, you are clear. Uh, but if you want to confirm and you want to be certain, obviously a model will be, will be a, a good way to do it. Now, below, as I said, if you are less than 40 and you are considered as a potential donor, um, uh, it would be difficult to make that decision and, and, uh, based on ultrasound, so MRI, uh, would give you an idea because if it's more than 10 cysts by MRI, you are already BKD, so below age 40. So I wouldn't uh, rely on ultrasound and excluding patient less than 40. Okay. 
Muhammad. Next question from Dr. Baba Adamo. He's asking about if there are any studies which can confirm the beneficial effect of modification of diet uh, to reduce glucose level in non-diabetic BTD patients. Are there any studies confirming that? There is a lot of studies in animal models. All of them were successful, by the way, in BTD, animal model. Okay, and there are ongoing uh, studies now in human about really uh, limiting caloric intake, specifically glucose, uh, in BKD adult patients. So in, 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 in animal model, all of the uh, um, options that I, I mentioned in metabolic uh, rewiring, uh, targeting that pathway have been tested and have been shown to be successful in an animal model. Uh, right now in, in human, uh, these are still ongoing. Okay, Dr. Yasser Idris question. Uh, the use of conivaptan to treat the uh, BKD. Is there a difference between conivaptan and pervaptan? And um, can we use uh, conivaptan to treat the uh, BKD patients? It is the same drug, but the dose is different. I mean, pervaptan. And, and the conivaptan is given intravenous. Huh? Uh, oh, you mean is given intravenous. It is very difficult to, to yes. Conivaptan? Yes. It's yeah. form. I, I thought he's talking about tolvaptan because the tolvaptan we have, we have two ways of prescribing tolvaptan. One is called Janarki, which is for BKD patients. Uh, that's, a, that's a V2 receptor. It's still like tolvaptan, but it's called Janarki, and that's really for BKD patients. And then tolvaptan, that's specifically or exclusive for hyponatremia patients. So we have two different forms of tolvaptan or V2 receptor blocker, one for hyponatremia, one for BKD with different names, but it's the same product and the dose, doses are different as well. The IV form of BEP pens, uh, nobody uses that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we cannot, I think we cannot use them intravenous to suppress cystogenesis. I, say, I think it's not, not practical. It's not practical and nobody even uses it for yes. any reasons. Oh. And they can uh, lead to very uh, rapid fluctuation in sodium. Yeah. And it's a uh, quite problem. So yeah. it is not, uh, I think it is not rational at all to use Convaptan for treating polycystic kidney disease. Yeah. Well, uh, the, there was a question in the chat about the uh, best use and the best dosage of Tolvaptan for suppressing oh. this. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's really a regret because it's we have to get liver function on the on a regular basis on those patients as by the FDA uh, uh, recommendations. We cannot really start the patients so that the final dose is 120 and it's divided, uh, divided into two doses, one in the morning, one at night. And, and the night dose is usually the, the bigger one. So 30 and 90, that's the final dose. But we start actually with 15 and 30. So, so, and then as we move forward over three months, we upgrade the dose, up titrate the dose up to the final dose, which is 120, uh, which will be 30 in the morning and 90 at night. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Gahad. Regarding the study that you refer to, to the American Journal of Kidney Disease about reducing bolioria by cutting down salt and, and protein. In the, full, in the full text of this article, they mentioned to distribute the two doses of tolvaptan, but to give the large dose in the morning. And the lower dose, uh, so 9 a.m. is the larger dose, and the 5 a.m. is the smaller dose right. to avoid bolure during the night. But right. now you mentioned yeah. the reverse. Yeah, so the problem is that really the ADH lies happening at night. Yes. So, so you. You, you, you uh, yourself, uh, the, this is your prescription to give it, right. yes, right. okay, the, the, the bigger dose in the night. Yeah, because that's when you want to inhibit EDH. That's where the rise in the hormone. But we should advise the patient not to take dinners or something like that in the, in the evening because it will worsen the situation. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Mohammed. We'll continue, uh, Dr. Dr. Bassam Sadr asked about uh, the measuring, the measurement of total kidney volume. Should it be done best by MRI or CT scan? And is there any difference if, if it is enhanced or not enhanced? No, you don't need to have enhanced uh, uh, picture. 
I mean, really for BKD, you just, uh, you need the, the, the coronal section, the sagittal section, and the cross-sectional section. So you, enhancing uh, the, the, or giving a contrast is really, is, uh, is useless, basically. Is the MRI to give you the CAT scan, the CAT scan or the MRI are fine. We prefer the MRI uh, because obviously it's, uh, uh, the software can calculate. I mean, if you do a CT scan, I'm not sure that you will have to measure it yourself or you have the radiologist measure it for you uh, um, in terms of really the TKD. But you can do it with CAT scan. It's much easier. The MRI have the software to calculate the TKD for you. I think the, the majority of studies, uh, the, the, Dr. Muhammad, they're using MR to calculate the volume. Right. And uh, it, is, it is difficult to advise for CT, frequency use of CT because of radiation. Second point, uh, I don't need uh, um, contrast in MRI, and it would depend upon the characteristic of the cyst in T1 and T2. So it is, it is enough the, uh, because I'm not searching for malignancy or something like that to give gadolinium. So MRI sure. without gadolinium, depending on T1 and T2, is, I think it's excellent. The main problem is the closed loop system, closed system of MRI and the claustrophobia. Uh, but it is, it is the best to be used for uh, polycystic kidney. We, we, I have a question here, Professor Atta, regarding the pro BKD scoring. Because pro uh, BKD scoring depends upon mutation, uh, either truncating or not and then some clinical data, hypertension, uh, and others. What is, uh, do you use uh, ProBKD to predict the uh, progression and the occurrence of any stage or? Yeah, yeah. So that's a European score that has been devised, in, I believe, in Italy. And, uh, and uh, it's, as you mentioned, depending on the uh, mutation. As, we, uh, as I said, we don't do genetic analysis for our BKD patients to actually uh, with that score. So we okay. don't use that score. And you don't need more, basically, data. The, the, first of all, you are not going to use it to treat or not to treat patients. We use the TPV, which is very simple. You do MRI, you get the data, you know what to expect and whether you need to treat the patients or not and how to monitor them. Uh, 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 it's, um, yes. uh, excuse me. Uh, about the... Uh, the, the multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Mm -hmm. I think uh, um, uh, phase one and phase two showed significant reduction in the uh, total kidney volume. And it's now uh, tried in the phase three. Uh, oh. You think this is a, a promising drug that uh, could be, uh, I mean, as effective as the V2 uh, inhibitor? I hope. Uh, it's, I, hope. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, the... Uh, this is Vatinam, Vatinam, I think. Yes, yes. So, so the tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, the, the, have been, as I said, my list was not exclusive or every trial on Earth. There is a lot of pathways that have been targeted. Some of them I mentioned, some of them I didn't. Um, as I mentioned, the, the microRNA 17, which is also has been successful in phase one and phase two. The tyrosine kinase has been also successful in phase one and phase two. But the problem is phase three is really where you get the, your answer because the safety the major problem is tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, yes. So that's really, the, the, it's gonna be the, 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 the key for success. I mean, you can treat the disease, but kill the patient. So that's not gonna help. Uh, and, and one of the problems with tyrosine kinase inhibitors has been uh, really the, the adverse events or the uh, side effect profile because of the off-target effect. There are uh, new tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is more specific, that is being mm -hmm. tested now in lupus patients. And uh, I think that maybe this can be also repurposed for, for BQD patients. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hadi. Okay. The next question uh, regarding the use of mTOR inhibitor: Is there any benefit for ivirolimus in comparison to sirolimus? Are they the same? What, what, what is the question again? I'm sorry. I, I think, you, Dr. Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Hadi, I think it was clear from the presentation. Both mTOR inhibitors were frustrating, either sirolimus or ivirolimus. 
yeah. both of them failed to make any any significant change in polycystic kidney disease yeah. management. Right. So the only the only addition I'm going to add here, the Everolimus, if if you have a patients who have the two mutation BKD1 mutation and tuberous sclerosis, yes. you can use Everolimus in this context. But just for BKD1, no. Okay. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Professor Said Hamis. He, he he wants to share. Okay, Professor Said. Said you, you, Okay, thanks, thanks, Mohammed. Thanks, Dr. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor, for this elegant and illustrative lecture. I have just three short questions, if you allow me, uh, allow me. It is practical question. Number one, if you have a patient with uh, polycystic kidney disease and has an extra uh, uh, renal manifestation in the form of uh, colonic diverticulosis, uh, is it preferable to avoid uh, the peritoneal dialysis in such a patient for fear of? diverticulitis and the uh, gram-negative peritonitis, which is very serious complication. That's number one. Number two, why some patients with polycystic kidney disease... Let, let us take, excuse me, Dr. Said. let us yeah. to, uh, uh, one take by one. One, one by one, please. Okay. Regarding okay. the presence of diverticulosis or the fear of diverticulitis, do, do you prefer uh, to avoid BD, Dr. Uh, Atta? We don't. We don't really uh, uh, avoid uh, BD in patients with diverticulosis. We have a lot of patients with diverticulosis, not just because of PKD, just in the general population. And that's not an exclusion criteria to actually uh, avoid or, or, or contraindicated in, indicated in BKD patients. So, so we use uh, uh, PD and very successfully in, in uh, BKD okay. patients, especially that a lot of these patients are young and very um, um, really good about really making sure that they do you know, safe PD compared to, for instance, an elderly patient. So I, I think for the first question, you can still use PD. And, and okay, thanks. Second question is, uh, why some patients with other stomach uh, uh, is having uh, polycythemia, we know, or high hemoglobin, even with CKD, uh, because of the erythropoietin and so, but why some patient has polycystic and in the meantime normal hemoglobin, or even low hemoglobin, with even with rising serum creatinine? What is the explanation? So you said that uh, some BKD patients, I would say, ten percent of patients have polycythemia. So what is this? The rest of them will have basically lower hemoglobin, like any CKD patients. Yeah. So. So is there any explanation for this? Well, I mean, so if you have any interstitial fibrosis in BKD patients where actually erythropoietin is being produced, you will have uh, obviously lack of erythropoietin production yeah. from, from the interstitial cells that will lead to lower hemoglobin. So um, that's, that's the mechanism for anemia or uh, in, in those patients. So, so basically, it's it's it depends on where where your cyst is being formed and whether you have uh, uh, fibrosis or uh, 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 destruction of the interstitial space as well, uh, that would lead to uh, anemia in, in these patients. Yeah, sir. And the last question regarding uh, the patient with polycystic kidney disease, if he develop uh, deterioration of uh, kidney function, say creatinine three four. As an nephrologist, usually we fear, uh, we are afraid to continue with uh, S inhibitors or uh, ARBs despite their great benefit, as you know, uh, as an anti medication. So, and also the calcium channels, there are some uh, calcium channel brokers, there are some concerns, I mean, theoretical concern regarding the polycystic uh, or the cystic formation. So, so in this dilemma, what do you prefer to continue with the S ARBs or to, to go to the calcium channel blocker? Thank you so much. Sure. We prefer uh, uh, ACE and ARB over anything and renin inhibitors to uh, in this uh, uh, patient population. So I think uh, we have to be aggressive and I uh, wouldn't fear about really uh, 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 further uh, physiological decline in UFR because of these drugs. As long as you control the potassium, I think uh, these uh, and these ha studies have been done actually using ACE and ARB in late stages of CKD and you can tell that those patients actually have less progressive disease as long as, again, if you 
have a good educated patients that can actually control the potassium, or on the other hand, I have patients that I use is an arborenin inhibitor, and then I give them a, a potassium lowering agent with that just to give them the benefit of, of these medications if I'm not going to treat them with, uh, for instance, B2 receptor blocker as well. Thank you, Professor. Th thank you, Professor Saeed, for raising the, okay, the, Dana, the, the problem of calcium channel blockers because uh, uh, I myself don't like to start with calcium channel blocker. Uh, so the, uh, the calcium channel blocker, I think it, it is preferred to be left as a last resort. So we start with ACE or ARBs, then according to the patient demographics, if the patient is edematous, diuretics is the second class. If it's not edematous, we may, start, we may add beta blocker. If the blood pressure is not controlled, calcium channel blocker can be added at the last added drug. Because we respect, even if it's theoretical, that calcium channel blocker increases to genesis, it's better not to start with them. Yes. Dr. Ayman? Um, in our transplantation practice, also we realize that uh, uh, transplant patients with original kidney disease, polycystic kidney, uh, they have a lot or increased instance of BTDMD, uh, post transplant diabetes. And another observation that they have a lower instance of rejection episodes. There are some sporadic, uh, actually, reports supporting that. Would you agree on that? And do you have any uh, pathophysiologic explanation or genetic background on uh, this phenomenon? Why patients with BTD develop? Post transplant? Uh, yes, frequently or increased instance uh, significantly uh, post transplant diabetes and lower instance of rejection. D did you realize this in your practice, or uh, there are some sporadic reports? Uh, well, all PTD patients, this. yeah, I agree with you. PTD patients actually do well in terms of post transplant, in terms of uh, graft survival. Yes, uh, yeah. So, so. But also, you, you, I mean, you, you do, uh, if, if you adjust for all the, uh, the other factors, like for instance, they generally mm -hmm. take a relatives' uh, kidneys because you do live donors, right? Yes. So, so, so for BKD patients, we know that they have less uh, rejection episodes. I'm not sure I know the answer why, uh, uh, why they have less rejection yeah. episodes, but the but for the, uh, uh, whether the metabolic rewiring they had before transplant as a BTD patients actually predisposed them to post-transplant diabetes, uh, I'm not sure. There was a hypothesis that uh, polycystic kidney disease have as well cysts in pancreas, but pancreas. when they tested cohort, yes, and when they studied cohort of patients, they found cysts in pancreas is only in 8%, so it doesn't, explain why polycystic kidney is associated and they put a hypothesis that it may be due to increased insulin resistance. Um, another point here in the transplant recipients, the issue of nephrectomy. Do you, uh, <laughs> because we have we many schools. Yeah. We have many schools. We have uh, here, what we do is unilateral nephrectomy to leave a space if the kidney is very big. And uh, we heard from uh, some colleagues from the United States and uh, read papers about simultaneous bilateral nephrectomy and transplantation. Yeah. I'd like to hear from you about this, uh, say, this yeah, issue. I, 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 think, I think it's a problem if you remove especially the, the right kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if you, if you want to remove a large kidney, I would remove the left kidney, not the right kidney. And the reason for that, because once you remove the right kidney, you're going to have to worry about your liver uh, that oh. can actually enlarge and, and, and really will be like a huge baby in the patient's abdomen. So I think I, think I wouldn't, I would, we don't generally recommend uh, nephrectomy pre-transplant unless really, as you mentioned, it's really uh, difficult to put the new kidney because of the huge kidney. But... Uh, Definitely, the left side would be the preferred side to, to remove. But it is fantastic and exciting for us, and I think Professor Ayman agree with me. We don't uh, consider this point because we are not uh, 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 expecting that if we remove the right kidney, liver will enlarge. We will not, so this is a very, very interesting point. 
because usually we use the right side for the first transplant. No, I know. Uh, no. But that's why we don't really recommend nephrectomy yes. for kidney disease. Okay. Professor Faisal, Shaheen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor Abbas, for this excellent talk. Uh, I, I wonder if you can just mention something about uh, liver cyst, which is accompanied with uh, polycystic kidney disease, and is the management will target both uh, cysts in the kidney and the liver as well, or extra uh, cyst manifestation? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is a very good question, and, and uh, the the answer uh, is not really this, uh, uh, studied so far about really the effect of uh, B2 receptor on liver cyst compared to uh, uh, kidney cyst. So it hasn't been studied. And also the issue is that uh, polycystic, there is also, the, 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 I don't know if you remember the ER proteins that I discussed, some of the mutation in the genes encoding for these proteins can lead to uh, polycystic liver disease mostly rather than polycystic kidney disease. So the majority of cysts can be in the liver rather than in the kidney based on which mutation you get. And there is no study that I'm aware of that have looked actually about uh, targeting uh, the cystic growth in, in, in B2 patients. But it's a for sure. Dr. Faisal, do you, do, you, do you have any points? Dr. Faisal? Well, well I, I, I think it's an excellent talk and okay. uh, until now, we don't reach something, some conclusive things to treat the polycystic kidney disease, uh, except if we pay a lot of money and then waiting for the for the result. Uh, we, either it would be cured completely or not. We still we we don't we, we are not yet in that state. Even if it is expensive to treat, but we don't cure them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Here, here is a question in the chat. Uh, do screen a autosomal dominant polycystic kidney patients for in, intracranial aneurysm, Briar? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. so the, the intracranial uh, aneurysm is a very- Prior to transplant of family yeah. history of aneurysm, yes. Right. So if you, if, you, if you have family history, definitely everybody should be screened for intracranial aneurysm. As I said, the intracranial aneurysm happen in about 8% of patients. And uh, we recommend the screening for patients with family history, patients with headache, severe headache patients with uh, uh, who are actually doing uh, a very important job like a pilot. So if you have a pilot who has PKD, you have to screen them for intercranial aneurysm because you don't want them to have a problem uh, 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 as a pilot. Uh, and also pre-donation, I mean, uh, uh, if, if they have severe headache. Those are the, the, the recommendation for screening. Regarding PKD patients, who died, should we consider this for a disease donation? If uh, this cadaver has a uh, preserved kidney function? You mean uh, uh, BKD patients who had a transplanted kidney? No, no, no. B BKD patients with normal kidney function. Uh, do you accept this patients to donate the kidney in cadaveric uh, program? What is the function? It's okay the if it is preserved. If you have yeah. polycystic poly kidney with uh, proven cysts right. and uh, with preserved kidney function. Well, yeah. and and yeah. Yes, sure. So, so obviously this will not be happening in, in oh. the US, right? To take a polycystic kidney and transplant it in, in, a, in a normal person. Uh, but if, you, if you're gonna transplant at 60 years old and you say that this polycystic kidney is a stage 1A or 1B, uh, it's going to live with them for a while. I mean, it's it's a consideration, but I don't think it's as of now that this is a recommendation to take the polycystic kidney for donation. Do you counsel the females for pregnancy? Is there a problem in recurrent pregnancies to enhance estrogenesis? Well, for my, we yeah. that estrogen obviously uh, enhances uh, uh, cystogenesis. And we, we, we tell the patients about the risks. I mean, but obviously this is an important uh, thing for females that they want to consider. Uh, but I, I think even with these consideration, uh, most 
woman that we tell them that uh, there is a risk for cyst growth with pregnancy, uh, they still do it. Professor Mahmoud, we have five minutes and we'll stop. So because now we are two hours. Professor Mahmoud. Hello, Mahmoud. Hello. my voice is okay? It's okay, very nice. Go ahead. Thank you, Prof, for the nice lecture and thank you, Dr. Hussain. One small comment and one question, please. The comment is that mentioning the pregnancy and the uh, polycystic kidney disease, it's uh, coming in young and old, especially in females. Sometimes during our routine uh, practice, it's amazing to, to, to highlight to the female that with pregnancy, there is a hazard of the RBs or AC inhibitors for, for, the, for, for early in pregnancy. So it's very important to highlight this one to them, especially if she come to you single, young, and later on she get married, maybe this one is missed. The I think question this is Regarding the ASAN or ARBs, it is the common uh, situation in all CKD patients, not only polycystic kidney disease, and to stop them beyond the first, after the first trimester is mandatory. Yeah, so, the problem with uh, polycystic kidney disease is it starts early. So that, you know, يعني, with starting early, maybe it missed during, she become, when she comes to you first, she was single. I found, I have one or two patients like this. Okay. She comes single, later she become uh, married, and just during follow-up, she, she was not taking any contraceptive. So risk was present there. The, the question, please, uh, do you, Professor, think that is rational now? We don't have tolvaptans, and there was a pilot study on use of metformin as a, th as a therapy. And now there is an ongoing trial. So my question is, is it rational to start using metformin based on the unaffordability of tolvaptans and the uh, uh, promising results of the uh, metformin? Professor Atta? Yeah, the answer is no, unless the patient is diabetic. Oh. Oh. Uh, we don't really prescribe medication based on small uh, uh, pilot studies. Uh, we, we, we only, we can use it like we use statin if the patient is hyperlipidemic. If the patient is diabetic, we can use metformin. But really, for the purpose of treating PKD, we don't. Okay, I think it is, it is rational not to use the drug until it's proven because on narrow scale may be okay, but on the big scale, you'll find the f uh, frustrating results as happened with immature inhibitors and somatostatin with polycystic kidney disease. So we should wait until it, 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 became, it becomes effective for management. But uh, the, the Professor Mahmoud uh, opened the, a, a problem, a practical problem that we face. If we have a patient with polycystic kidney disease, do you recommend to bring uh, sons and daughters to be investigated for the presence of polycystic early on polycystic kidney disease or at least to measure their blood pressure? We usually send them to a genetic counseling. So once, once we make a diagnosis, we tell the father or the, or the, the, uh, the person, the father or the mother, if they have uh, uh, kids that if they want to consider actually um, testing them or not and we get genetic counseling for them. The issue is that usually, at least until recently, the problem was if you test them, you can actually affect their insurance, health insurance uh, in the U.S. So generally, it's not a common practice unless the patient actually has a problem, especially that at the young age, you are not expecting any uh, uh, changes in in their in their life. If they are above 18 and their mother or father have a very aggressive disease, it may be a good idea because you may actually pick them up early enough that um, if you're going to treat them, you can't do just uh, testing if you are not going to treat them. Um, if you decide that this person may have aggressive CDE class of PKD, and we say that if they have, uh, if they are above the age of 18, and you expect them to be have, uh, to have these classes, and you're going to treat them, it's better to tell them, right? Yes. But, okay. uh, but, uh, but if you are not going to treat them, I don't know how you're going to actually uh, uh, tell them, that, well, you have it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. The problem is we, we may have polycystic kidney disease in younger age in the kids. And we, we, uh, if we treat, if we diagnose hypertension, for example, this may be a factor that can be uh, corrected 
and to reduce the problems of hypertension. So yeah. this is why I changed my mind in the last three years toward the screening. Yeah, well, I mean, you can, you can do a blood pressure control. I mean, you can yes. get them to have their family to check their blood pressure, but I'm saying about diagnosing BPD for them, it may affect their life. Uh, tremendously if they have it and so blood pressure control is important for everybody it may give them a clue obviously that if they have blood pressure high blood pressure at young age that they may have it uh, yes. yeah dr yasser the mullah the last point yes dr ayman uh, one of the uh, silly scenarios that we frequently encountered is the development of uh, complicated cysts in, in, in a patient with, uh, whether it's infection or hemorrhage, uh, in a patient with serum keratin around two, or, um, and the failure of all the measures of antibiotics to control uh, such infection. And you feel at a, at a time that you need to nephrectomize this, uh, this uh, kidney with the complication, for, which is the source of septicemia and vaginal condition. Uh, did you encounter such a uh, situation? At, what will you do after one month or two months of uh, IV uh, antibiotic therapy without response? Yeah, of course, uh, you very well know that some of the antibiotics do not, do not actually penetrate yeah. the system, right? Yeah. So you have to be aware of uh, which antibiotic you're going to use, but I I doubt that we have seen any cases that we had difficulty to treat infection. So with uh, with uh, with uh, we have good antibiotics to penetrate the cyst and treat them, um, and and generally you need pain control and a, a good antibiotic uh, that penetrate the cyst and and really we have been successful uh, treating this infection. Uh, hemorrhage, on the other hand, uh, you, you have to really control pain for the most part until it resolves. And sometimes we get the intervention radiologist if we, if we, uh, if we think that really that, that there is a problem with a large cyst that is really causing a lot of problem, we get uh, uh, intervention radiologist to, to go in and just uh, 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 evacuate it, basically. Yeah. The response to antibiotic may be easy with normal kidney function, but with CKD stage three or four, I think the antibiotic response is, is not that uh, as expected. So uh, at the time we have a, we have a patient that uh, he had the resistant infection for two months with serum creatinine ranging from three to five, and uh, failure of most of the classes of antibiotic to control such infection. So. Intravenous. Some, yeah, yeah, intravenous, of course. And this is uh, actually yeah, silly scenarios that we are facing every now and then. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we we think that if if we nephrectomize such kidney, uh, this is a multiple cyst, not a, if only one cyst. I mean, it's, 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 it's a silly infection. So you, you, you end would up. You agree, would you agree out. to to after failure of such treatment for for the sake of the patient life yeah. and yeah, if you have no choice to get rid of this kidney, yeah, you have no choice. No. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Ayman. Doctor Yasser Mullah. Excellent talk that covered all the aspects. Nothing to add. Okay, Doctor Tartan Tawi, the last. Doctor. Uh, السلام عليكم كل سنة طيبين سعيد جدا بليز انجلش طار دكتور طار بليز انجلش اوكي اي ام فيري هابي تو ليسن تو بروفيسور عطا توداي اند فيري فيري ثانكس فور يور اكسلنت برزنتيشن اند يور كومنتس فيري فيري وايز اند يو هاف ا لوت اوف اكسبيرينس اي ثينك اول اوف اس جوت بينيفيت فروم يور ديسكشن توداي ماني ثانكس ماني ثانكس ثانك يو ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور طار طنطاوي فور ذيس كومنت بيكوز ريلي I am very pleased uh, by the the information and brainstorming that we have uh, this night from Professor Atta. He really uh, makes uh, our mind uh, elated because uh, he 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 closed the door for emitter inhibitors and osumacetin analog, and then tulvaptan. It is uh, good, and uh, there are many issues in the pipeline 
uh, we are waiting. And now we have uh, Professor Esra Hamid. <laughs> he raised his hand. So the last, the last question for Professor Esra Hamid. Okay, Professor Yasser, unmute yourself because, yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Really, oh, I don't have uh, any questions. I was uh, unlucky, unlucky enough to attend all the lecture, but I really enjoyed my, very much this discussion. And uh, I got many yeah. informations, new informations and updated informations just from the discussions only. So thank you very much okay. all. Thank you, Professor Atta. Thank you all professors for this highly elegant and informative discussion. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Professor Yasser, it is, wonderful. Uh, it is very wonderful. It is a very wonderful meeting, Professor Atta. Really, I enjoyed so much. And um, I'm leaving the floor to Professor Amir Fai to close the session. Thank you. I, uh, I want to express my, uh, I'm really happy, happy to, uh, oh. to and enjoyed this uh, scientific uh, uh, and talk. It, it's, uh, I enjoyed very much. I enjoyed a lot. Uh, to see you and to, to hear you after a long time, uh, you are actually a, a, a very, very uh, dear friend, uh, and uh, I enjoyed listening and hearing from you, uh, and God bless you. Oh, thank thank you. you very much, I and I hope that we can, and, um, okay meet again and again in uh, the near future. And uh, I asked Professor Hussain to uh, organize uh, other uh, updated issues uh, presented by uh, Professor Atta uh, to uh, continue this series of uh, wonderful scientific updates. Thank you very much, Professor Hussain. Thank you very much, Professor Atta, for being with us. Thank you. Okay. Okay, this is the end of, and uh, as Professor uh, Aymer Fai mentioned, this is an invitation for Professor Atta to join us whenever he uh, has a time. He is very welcome because today this is a real wonderful update for polycystic kidney disease. Uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, Professor Hussain, I appreciate uh, your choice of the talks. Uh, which again, it, it is very wealthy for all of us uh, to hear such uh, an eminent uh, professor like Atta and giving a good talk, excellent, uh, straightforward talk about uh, very difficult su subject. And, uh, uh, and he mentioned many things, how to treat and how things will go in the future. I appreciate uh, what, uh, whatever you did, uh, Professor Hussain, for excellent uh, management and organization of this uh, uh, contributive educational material and webinar. And thanks to Professor Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you, thank you for your very kind Hello. statement, uh, Professor Faisal. And uh, it is really the choice of uh, Professor Amir Rafai with Professor Atta. So he sent to us uh, very interesting uh, uh, topics. And uh, Professor Amir Rafai and me selected genetics and the polycystic kidney disease because we didn't discuss it before. And I hope in the near future that Professor Atta will have a time to join us for a nice fruitful night like this. Well, and I'm, I'm going to upload the meeting to the YouTube and uh, I'm going to send it to you and to all uh, uh, our professors and colleagues the, the link. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you.